In the last episode of the series on AI in the mind, we began our consideration of the problem of rationality with a look at the argument from reason. The argument from reason is a general philosophical argument that applies to any project that seeks to completely reduce the rational to the physical or the mental to the material or the mind to the brain. We've been calling such a project physical reductionism, and I've claimed that it is the strongest motivation for the belief in an actually conscious and intelligent AI. Now, given the strength of the argument from reason, you might think that physical reductionists are busying themselves formulating cogent responses to it in an effort to grapple with the problem of human rationality. But you'd be wrong. In fact, I think that it's safe to say that most computer and cognitive scientists, as well as philosophers of mind, do not consider human rationality to be particularly problematic from a physical reductionist perspective. And this is because of the widespread belief that computers are able to perform so many of the tasks that have been traditionally thought to be uh, exclusive to human rationality. Computers can even perform seemingly rational functions such as complex mathematics and pattern recognition far better and faster than humans can. So regardless of the theoretical power of the argument from reason, many believe that computers can already, in some sense, think, and therefore that whatever human rationality is, it can, in principle, be reproduced in a wholly material machine. In this final episode of AI in the Mind, it's time for us to take aim at the widespread claim that whatever the rational mind of a human can do, computers will one day be able to do as well. It's time to see why genuine intelligence can never be ascribed to a computer. Without question, what is driving the belief that computers will soon think like humans is the underlying belief that the human mind itself is just a kind of biological computer. Now, if you've been playing along in this series, you'll recognize this view of the mind as a form of reductive functionalism called the computational theory of the mind, where the mind is understood as a kind of software run on a kind of computer hardware that is the brain. Now, remember that a way a computer works is by receiving causal inputs that in turn modify its internal state in some way, which in turn causes an effect or an output that consists in a visual display on a monitor. And all of this happens according to a well-defined system of cause and effect or input-output relations. On the computational theory of the mind, human rationality is reducible in principle to the same basic kind of functional system of causal inputs and outputs, that characterize computers. Mental states are nothing more, nothing over and above functional states. All there is to having a mind on this view is implementing the right kind of program. The computational theory of the mind is thus a form of physical reductionism, since it claims that the mind is nothing more than a causal network of physical inputs and outputs, just like a computer. And as I said in a previous episode, the computational theory of mind is far and away the most popular view among computer and cognitive scientists, as well as philosophers of mind today. And it's not hard to see why. Modern technology has allowed us to outsource and automate so much of our reasoning to digital computers of various kinds. Computers have in many ways become extensions of human rationality. Moreover, Modern neuroscience has shown us that the human brain generates electrical activity in the process of thinking. Just like the human brain, a computer consists of bits of matter with electrical current flowing between them. So it's hard to resist the powerful analogy between the electrical activity in the brain on the one hand and the electrical activity in a computer on the other. The computational theory of the mind is sometimes referred to as Turing machine functionalism a term that references the father of modern computational theory and the man that many consider to be the father of artificial intelligence, Alan Turing. 
In addition to building primitive computers, computers that helped crack the German Enigma code of World War II, Turing also conceptualized the universal Turing machine. Turing imagined a physical device that was capable of implementing any algorithm that could be specified. Modern computers are basically the realization of the Turing machine. Computers are increasingly able to run more and more complex programs or algorithms. Turing machine functionalism, then, is the name for the view that sees the mind as a kind of Turing machine. Again, on this view, thinking is understood as nothing more than the implementation of an algorithm by the physical brain. The mind is just the software run on the brain. Turing is also famous for coming up with the Turing test, which is the test of a computer's ability to mimic human intelligence. The Turing test is performed by having a person engage in separate digital conversations with another human and with a computer. The test is set up so that the only way the person could try to tell whether he was talking to a human or to a computer was by evaluating the digital conversation. If the person could not reliably tell which digital conversation was coming from a human and which was coming from the computer, the computer would pass the Turing test. Now, in the opinion of many today, a computer that can pass the Turing test is able to engage in at least some primitive form of thinking. In fact, the commonly held belief today is that computers have far surpassed already the Turing test and can already outthink humans in many ways. As I said, there's widespread belief that computers will soon completely eclipse human rationality. This is a view that is consistently trumpeted by technology moguls like Elon Musk, who think that it's only a matter of time before machine intelligence can surpass human intelligence in every way. Now, claims like these are typically based on the comparison of the computing power of the brain versus the computing power of our best computers. Again, if you reduce the mind to a biological machine, then measuring the intelligence of a computer against the human brain becomes a simple matter of computing power. However, as powerful and suggestive as the similarities between a computer and the brain may be, the computational theory of the mind in particular and reductive functionalism in general fail as an account of human rationality. And the reason they fail is that they leave something critically important out of the picture when it comes to what it means to be rational. Now, to see what's left out, we need to consider a famous thought experiment in the philosophy of mind called the Chinese Room Argument. This was developed by philosopher John Searle. Now, before we look at the argument, we need to first lay some groundwork. According to Searle, one way to understand what a computer does and does not do is by considering the distinction between the linguistic terms syntax and semantics. Syntax refers to the formal structure and features of a language. Here we're talking about the shape and position of the letters, for example, or the rules of grammar. Semantics, on the other hand, refers to the meaning of the words and sentences of a language. So, for example, let's look at the word cat. To consider the word syntactically is to consider the material and structural aspects of the letters, C-A-T. These letters have a certain shape to them that identifies them and the specific role that they play in the English language, which is defined in detail by the rules of grammar. Then, of course, we could consider the word cat semantically. To do so, we, would, we wouldn't focus in on any of the physical aspects of the word, say the shape of the letters or their function in the English language. Rather, we would consider what the word means or what it points to or what it intends. We'd probably form an image of a house cat in our mind and maybe even um, consider a concept like domestic species of feline or something. The key thing to see here is that syntax and semantics are not the same. We have to distinguish between the spoken or written physical structure of the letters, words, and sentences of the language on the one hand, and the meaning of those words and sentences on the other. Now, a digital computer works by running or implementing programs or software that are made up of a set of algorithms. An algorithm is simply a set of mechanical instructions for the processing of physical symbols. Now, because of this, 
Searle says that we can think of a digital computer as a syntactic engine, since what a computer does is merely manipulate physical symbols according to a set of encoded mechanical rules or a program. Searle seeks to demonstrate that modeling the human mind on the running of a computer program is not sufficient to account for human intelligence because human intelligence is more than just a syntactical engine like a computer. And this is because human rationality is not just a matter of syntactical processing, which is what computers do. Unlike computers, human rationality is also concerned with semantics, with intentionality, with meaning. So let's listen to the thought experiment in Searle's own words. He asks us to consider the following scenario. Quote, suppose I am placed in a room containing baskets full of Chinese symbols. Suppose also that I am given a rule book in English for matching Chinese symbols with other Chinese symbols. The rules identify the symbols entirely by their shapes and do not require that I understand any of them. The rules might say such things as, take a squiggle squiggle sign from basket number one and put it next to a squaggle squaggle sign from basket number two. Imagine that people outside the room who understand Chinese hand in small bunches of symbols and that in response, I manipulate the symbols according to the rule book and hand back more small bunches of symbols. Now the rule book is the computer program. The people who wrote it are programmers, and I am the computer. The basket full of symbols are the database. The small bunches that are handed into me are questions, and the bunches I then hand out, answers. Now suppose that the rule book is written in such a way that my answers to the questions are indistinguishable from those of a native Chinese speaker. For example, the people outside might hand me some symbols that unknown to me mean, what's your favorite color? And I might, after going through the rules, give back symbols that, also unknown to me, mean, my favorite is blue, but I also like green a lot. I satisfy the Turing test for understanding Chinese. All the same, I am totally ignorant of Chinese. And there is no way I could come to understand Chinese in the system as described, since there is no way that I can learn the meanings of any of the symbols. Like a computer, I manipulate symbols, but I attach no meaning to the symbols. Searle then goes on to explain, quote, The point of the thought experiment is this. If I do not understand Chinese solely on the basis of running a computer program for understanding Chinese, then neither does any digital computer solely on that basis. Digital computers merely manipulate formal symbols according to rules in the program. Having symbols by themselves, just having the syntax, is not sufficient for having the semantics. Merely manipulating symbols is not enough to guarantee knowledge of what they mean." End quote. What Searle wants us to see is that symbol manipulation, no matter how complex, will never be enough to count as genuine thinking, because human thinking fundamentally involves meaning and you cannot reduce semantics to syntax or get meaning from the manipulation of symbols. You cannot derive meaning from syntax alone. That's the point of the Chinese room thought experiment. No matter how, how good the person in the Chinese room gets at recognizing the incoming symbols and producing the outgoing symbols, he will never come to learn the meaning of those symbols simply by means of syntactical manipulation. He can do this for a thousand years. He can even memorize the rules of the book so he doesn't even have to reference it anymore. But he will never, through this process, learn Chinese. Now, what's true of the man in the Chinese room is true of every computer, no matter how advanced. Computing will never add up to rationality. Now, if Searle is right, and I think that he clearly is, then it means that reductive functionalism and the computational view of the mind are decidedly inadequate accounts of human rationality since they leave out semantics, they leave out meaning. Human cognition is more than a complex functional system consisting in causal relations between physical parts. 
the human mind is not reducible to something like a computer program running on the brain. A computer running a complicated algorithm that sets down syntactical instructions can mimic certain aspects of human rationality. And computers today can even pass the Turing test and do many things far better and faster than humans can. But no matter how fast and efficient digital computers become at computing, they will never amount to actual thinking because thinking involves semantics and not just syntax. There is no rational thinking without meaning. In fact, what functionalism and the computational theory of the mind leave out is the most important and the most fundamental aspect of human cognition, understanding. Our ability to understand is the fundamental distinction that marks off humans as rational animals. It's what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. Only humans, among all animals in the world, can understand. And this is because understanding is a power of the human soul. By the power of understanding, we're able to abstract the intelligible natures of things. We're able to imbue our thoughts with meaning. We're able to know the world of things by the light of reason. Humans have the unique ability to form concepts, to combine concepts together into judgments, and to engage in reasoning by moving from one judgment to another according to the rules of logic and rational thought. And all of this is grounded and dependent on the fundamental ability of the human intellect to understand. Intelligence requires understanding. And a machine, no matter how sophisticated, will never be able to understand because you cannot build intelligence and understanding from the ground up if all you have to work with are mindless particles. Understanding is not a feature of any aggregate of material bits of reality. It's a basic power of the human soul that is not reducible to anything more fundamental. So the idea that the mind is a kind of software run on the brain can't possibly be true because it doesn't account for the most important and characteristic feature of human rationality, the power to understand. If John Searle is right, no computer program, no matter how advanced, will ever be able to be truly intelligent because syntax can never amount to semantics. Following an algorithm can never amount to understanding. However, the problem with the computational theory of the mind doesn't end here. It gets worse. The Chinese room argument shows that even if the brain could be said to process information in a syntactical sense, this would not amount to thinking because it leaves out semantics or understanding. But the question of whether the brain does in fact process information in the syntactical sense is left open and unaddressed by this argument. However, Searle later goes on to offer a powerful argument against this idea too. That is, he argues against the idea that the brain processes information even in the syntactical sense. In other words, Searle argues that the brain cannot even be a syntactical engine in the first place because it doesn't engage in computation at all. And why not? Because on the physical reductionist picture, computation itself is a mind-dependent and observer-relative feature of physical processes rather than a feature that's intrinsic to physical processes. Searle's argument for the mind dependence of computation, uh, it's also very powerful, even if it's less widely known. It's also more difficult to follow than his Chinese argument. So let's see if we can't make sense of it. To see why computation is mind dependent and observer relative, remember that computation is just the manipulation of symbols according to a set of mechanical instructions. Now, the problem here is that things only count as symbols in the first place because beings with intelligence use them that way. For example, consider language. Human languages, whether spoken or written, are artifacts of intelligence. For ease, let's just focus on written language here. A letter in a written language, in and of itself, is just some physical mark made on some kind of a, a physical substrate. All by itself, the letter P is just a meaningless, purposeless physical mark. But in the context of a human language, these meaningless marks symbolize the letter P. The fact that this mark represents or acts as a P in the English language 
is observer relative. All by itself, and apart from any intelligence using it as a symbol for a letter, P is nothing more than a meaningless mark. There is nothing about the physical makeup of the mark that makes it a P in the English language. The status of being a symbol is one that is imposed by a mind. It's not an objective or intrinsic, uh, intrinsic feature of any physical thing. Now, what is true of physical marks that make up the letters in a language is just as true of the physical bits that make up a computer. The physical states of a computer are meaningless in and of themselves. It's only because rational agents have assigned a syntactical interpretation to those states that they count as computational states in the first place. Thus, computation is mind-dependent. Philosopher Edward Fazer summarizes Searle's point this way. He writes, quote, Computation boils down to the instantiation of symbols. The problem is this. The status of being a symbol is simply not an objective or intrinsic feature of the physical world. It is purely conventional or observer-relative. And thus, the status of being something that is running an algorithm or processing information or computing is also conventional or observer-relative, rather than an intrinsic and objective feature of any physical system. This is obviously true where the computers of everyday experience are concerned. What they do con constitutes the processing of symbols or bits of information according to an algorithm only because human designers and users of the machine count the electrical states as symbols, the transitions between states as the implementation of an algorithm, and so on, end quote. A computer, in and of itself, is never doing anything like computing or processing information or running an algorithm. A computer is only computing because rational agents are using the computer as a tool and designing and defining what it is doing for that end. Consider that when you use your calculator to add 2 plus 2 to get the result 4, it's not the calculator that's doing the calculating. You're doing the calculating, and you're using the calculator as a tool. The same is true of even the most sophisticated computer in the world. In and of itself, it consists in nothing more than meaningless bits of matter existing in meaningless causal relations. This super, uh, the supercomputer is computing only in the sense that rational human agents have designed the physical states and interactions of the computer and have assigned syntactical interpretations to those states and interactions. Apart from human intentionality, a computer is nothing more than a composition of meaningless matter in motion. Just having a pattern of, of physical states and events is not enough for something to count as computation. You also need a mind to assign a syntactical interpretation to those physical patterns. Once again, Phaser is helpful. He writes, quote, The thing to emphasize is that the computer is not in and of itself carrying out logical operations, processing information, or doing anything else that might be thought a mark of genuine intelligence. Any more than a piece of scratch paper on which you've written some logical symbols is carrying out logical operations, processing information, or the like. Consider by themselves, and apart from the conventions and interactions of language users, Logical symbols on a piece of paper are just a bunch of meaningless ink marks. In exactly the same way, considered by themselves and apart from the intentions of the designers, the electrical currents in an electronic computer are just as devoid of intelligence or meaning as the current flowing through the wires of your toaster or hair dryer. There is no intelligence there at all. The intelligence is all in the designers and users of the computer just as it is all in the person who wrote the logical symbols in the piece of paper rather than in the paper itself. Indeed, that's the whole point of a computer in the modern sense. It's a way of using utterly unintelligent physical objects and processes to mimic various intelligent activities. End quote. The observer-relative nature of computation has devastating implications for the computational theory of the mind. Can you see it? If computers are not literally computing in and of themselves and apart from the intentions and conventions of rational users, then neither is the human brain. 
Remember that on reductive physicalism, there is no difference in kind, no fundamental difference between a computer and the brain. Both are nothing more, nothing over and above the microphysical bits of matter and causal relations of which they are made. A computer in and of itself is not processing information, even in the syntactical sense, because syntax requires symbols and the state of being a symbol is observer relative. For the very same reason, a brain in and of itself is also not processing information, even in the syntactical sense, because again, syntax requires symbols and the state of being a symbol is observer relative. So the problem here is that the computational theory of the mind was supposed to explain human rationality on the model of a computer. But since computation itself is mind dependent, you cannot explain the working of a computer without reference to a human mind. But then you cannot explain the human mind on the model of computation, since the very idea of computation itself requires a mind. Since computation presupposes a rational perspective, it cannot be used to explain rationality. If Searle's arguments go through, and I think it's obvious that they do, then the computational theory of the mind fails to capture the true nature of human rationality, because it fails to account for both the semantical and the syntactical nature of human intelligence. So in this series on AI and the mind, we've been examining what I consider to be the best hope and the greatest source of optimism for the possibility of building a truly intelligent machine, and that is the philosophy of physical reductionism. If the mind can be reduced to a kind of biological machine, then there's nothing in principle that could prevent us from creating a machine that could be intelligent, even if in practice we may be some way off from that goal. Yet, I've argued that physical reductionism gets it wrong when it comes to the mind. The mental simply cannot be reduced to the physical. We've now seen many reasons for this. There's the hard problem of consciousness and the challenge of accounting for first-person conscious experience in terms of the third-person language of physics. And this includes the problem of accounting for conscious experience of, of qualia, as well as the intentional nature of thought. We saw that the fundamental issue here was a construction problem. How can you possibly build a mind when all you have are mindless bits of matter as your building materials? And even if you could somehow start with the right kind of materials, there's still the binding problem to contend with. How do we get various pieces of, of conscious stuff to form a single unified conscious perspective that endures through time? We then turn to what I consider to be the hardest problem for a physical reductionist view of the mind, the problem of rationality. We saw that every project to reduce the mental to the physical runs up against the argument from reason. If the mind is reducible to the microphysical bits of reality, along with their causal relations, then human rationality is utterly destroyed. And finally, we looked here at a couple of special problems for the most popular view of the mind among physical reductionists, the computational theory of the mind. We saw that this view utterly fails to account both for the semantical and the syntactical nature of human rationality. Okay, so where does this leave us? Well, I think we can say with confidence that the project of accounting for the human mind in strictly material terms is one that is doomed to failure. There is simply more to the mind than what can be described in the mathematical language of modern physics. And this means that the task of creating a machine that can actually think, that can actually be rational, that is actually intelligent, is going to be much, much harder than most people today believe. In fact, for reasons that we've seen here, and many more reasons besides, I think the idea that we can somehow reverse engineer human intelligence and reproduce it in a machine is utterly ridiculous. Now, to be sure, I'm not saying that because AI cannot literally be intelligent, that it is therefore somehow not dangerous. Here I again agree with 
Fazer, who writes, quote, AI might end up being dangerous for the same sorts of reasons that other technologies can be dangerous. For example, we might become too dependent on it, or it might become too complex to control, or there might be glitches that lead to horrible accidents, and so forth. However, it will not become dangerous by virtue of becoming literally more intelligent than us, because it is not literally intelligent at all.